This next appointment is now key, yeah? This next appointment is the most important decision that has to be made to safeguard the future of this football club because for me, it's simply, simply, simply this, yeah? My faith and patience for Graham Potter was reflective of my faith and patience for the boards. You guys, you've heard my complaints and criticisms about the previous regime over the past few years. The vision I have of my football club, that vision is grand. I have visions of us being the best club in the world. That's the ambition I've always wanted to see at this football club. And this board has given me some hope with the players we've signed, the profiles we're bringing in, profiles that we've never typically been able to sign. There's a lot to look forward to in the future, but that future means nothing if the execution right now isn't being executed. And they've shown now with their decision making over the past seven months, they've got two managers wrong completely. Two. And we can't afford to waste any more time because I can't see a young, talented, high potential squad like this getting undermined because we still don't have a set identity, a way of playing, or like that team cohesiveness. This is the crunch period right now, and this next appointment has to be the appointment that puts us back all the way up here. So in today's video, I'm gonna go through five managerial candidates that I feel can be the right guys to bring us back there that can complement the players that already exist in the squad. And I feel are the most realistic ones, including one unrealistic one that I just have to talk about because I absolutely love this guy. So my friends, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. I hope you guys even learn a thing or two about some of these coaches I'm discussing. Of course, share your thoughts and opinions below. And if you like the video, I'd really love you guys hitting the like button. Let's go over 2K likes today. And without wasting any more time, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I have to get this wild card out of the way. Now, listen, I'm putting my hands up. I know that this is most likely the most impossible manager that we could hope to sign, but I have to discuss Mr. Deserby of Brian because I was first put onto Deserby because of one of like my favorite personal players, and that is Jeremy Boger. Now, when Boger was absolutely killing things at to swallow, playing on that left hand side, the skill, some of the individual goals, the moments. Deserby was his manager there, and Deserby's principles that he's shown at Sassuolo, then at Shakhtar, and now at Brian, they've always been the same. And the great thing is, is that his ideas kind of get better depending on the quality of players that he has at his disposal. Like a part of me would feel like in an alternate universe, we went straight for this guy, and if we did so, pff, I mean, who knows what's happening right now? because he knows how to get the best out of wingers. And that's based on his philosophies. The Zerbi is about his short passing possession game. He likes to have a double pivot that drops really deep alongside the center backs. And the key thing about his strategy and ideas here yeah, is how his teams pass the ball because there's a purpose behind the pass. Yeah, you might think these are like some pointless sideways passes. These aren't pointless passes. The idea behind this is to attract the opposition towards you. So by having lots of guys deeper in the build-up, you're hoping to attract the opposition your way. And it goes to such fine details where he even encourages the defenders, listen, before you even try and pass that ball to progress it, wait for pressure to come from the opponents. That way you're playing the best pass. And I guess it's no surprise that Levi Cord is absolutely excelling at Brian because this is one of the best ball playing defenders in Europe for his age. But on top of that too, he's a possession based manager where his teams create high quality and high volume opportunities. That is the key thing. And it's about how he likes his wingers or sometimes wing backs to keep that width. And it's about those wide rotations on the left and on the right. Because with those rotations either side, it's about freeing up the space in the middle for the number 10 for the striker up front, to not congest it so much in central positions. And then it's about the talent, the combinations, the ability for guys to take the man on. And that's why he favors inverted star wingers. Guys like Boga, Berardi, of course, famously Mudrik, who is absolutely in love with and feels like this guy can be a future Ballon d'Or winner. That is high praise. And for me, this is the type of lineup that I, I think I could see under the Zerbi, like a 4-2-3-1, Kante, Enzo in the pivot, Nudica on the left, Felix in the middle, on the right hand side, maybe Madueke. That could be Kai and up front. I mean, we don't really have a strike up front right now, right? I mean, up front, that's the, who cares who's up front? Yeah, that's the taking one right there. But anyway, I just felt like I had to show some love for the Zerbi because based on principles and how he plays, I think this guy could have done bits with his current squads. Now, the next manager that I want to move on to is the underdog, and that's actually Mauricio Pochettino. Now, I kind of feel like this guy got a bit of a very unfair rep during his time at Paris in Germain, and it's just like, ah, oh, 
I wish sometimes people cared about the details to understand you know, how these situations end up being that case to begin with. And long story short, if you're a manager that likes possession football that plays an asymmetrical style. So basically that just means that he likes hybrid players that can play in different positions in attack and defense. So for example, an Ericsson. An Ericsson can be a number 10, but he was also comfortable playing out wide as well too. And if you're having these guys picking up different positions, they have to be effective playing in multiple positions in game, right? And I think the biggest winner behind Pochettino's love for hybrid style players is Harry Kane, because I think Pochettino is the sole reason why Kane is how he is because he's developed him, he's encouraged him to revert deeper, he's encouraged different aspects in his game. That playmaking ability that Harry Kane is incredible at in the final third and I think that's an amazing example of just how good and strong his tactical ideas and philosophy is. And I think his ideas could benefit guys like Reese James and Ben because he likes his fullbacks or sometimes wingbacks to stay high and wide. He likes his attack to have those quick combinations in the middle. I mean, we saw what Son and Kane and Moore and all these guys were doing playing together. And they're a team that are comfortable using possession but can also penetrate teams on the counter-attack too. But to make all this style work here, yeah, it's about how you press and Spurs use the mid block under him, compact, very aggressive. But this is when it comes back to Paris and Germain because listen, that first season was there, it was not too bad at all and his ideas were kind of working. But the moment they added to Messi the following season afterwards, you got a front three of Neymar, Messi, and Bappi. Of course, it's spectacular on paper, but when it comes to the fundamentals of the game, like pressing, defending, like what are you expecting these men up front to do? That's going to have a detrimental impact to the rest of the guys in the team. But anyway, with the players we have, we have the pace that Pochettino loves to have in his team out wide up front too so those quick combination plays can work so these guys can penetrate with runs behind as well too this is the lineup i could see working alongside pochettino for me paris Saint germain doesn't necessarily reflect because he didn't have the right personnel really to make things happen there but we can't forget what he did with spurs because without pochettino there no one's talking about tottenham Tottenham were a team that were actually able to challenge for european sport they were pretenders beforehand and he got them to Cup finals, a Champions League final. Listen, for a club like Spurs, these are these are like winning trophies just to even participate in these big occasions. So that's Pochettino out of the way. We move on to the next one. And this is my wild card. And that is Luis Enrique. So I want you guys to just bear with me to understand why I think this guy could definitely work with the squad and players we have. What makes things easy is that he's currently free and available. And we do know that Enrique has been putting out fears to his agent that he wants to move to the Premier League. He wants to take over a Prem team and that's for very good reason because he is a great manager. Now I guess it's quite easy to simply reduce Enrique's spell at Barcelona as it's kind of common sense and straightforward that if you've got Neymar, Suarez and Messi that you just play towards their strengths and you're going to win games just like that. But I think as Pochettino showed at Paris in Germain, just having incredible attacking players doesn't mean you're going to have a super solid team as well. But this is where Enrique comes into play because he is about tweaks. That's what I like about Enrique. He adapted Barcelona's positional style game and he found more purpose behind it. Barcelona had Martino and guys like Villanova. Occasionally, their passing didn't have as much purpose and they could easily just be playing horizontal balls, not really penetrating the opposition. But Enrique created more vertical spaces to exploit teams in, and he made very smart tweaks. You know, he dropped the Bas midfield deeper. You know, Iniesta lost a little bit of focus from what he was originally doing under Pep Guardiola and others, but with that balance of having a midfield that was a little bit deeper, that was doing the defensive work for the front three, that opened the spaces for the front three. And it was how he used them because it took him a few tweaks to get there. But by having Messi dropping deeper, acting as that link between midfield and attack, it was kind of like Barcelona were like a 4-3-1-2 in that sense. And the fact that he's able to make the positional style game a bit more direct to free up the attacking guys into spaces of 1v1 situations, I think this is a very impressive thing to do. And it follows these three principles that he follows. He wants to have a numerical superiority, he wants to have a qualitative superiority, and he wants to have a positional superiority. So give you guys a long story short, numerical superiority just means creating overloads. Qualitative superiority just means 
he wants his best players 1v1 in spaces against the opposition players because if you have a higher order of beating your man 1v1 and for positional superiority all that means is he wants to have many options between the lines and many options in the box making runs in behind. Now it's funny because Graham Porter has been trying to instill these principles you know in the final few months before he got sacked but they didn't really work and that's because of the compactness the lack of shape the lack of structure we're getting open on the counter attack and sometimes it's poor game management decisions ended up costing the team instead of improving and helping the team. And Enrique is all about tweaks. Now, the way he used his vertical approach at Barcelona is not the same way that he used it uh, for the Spain national team, and it depends on the profiles he has. And this is where I want to show you guys my predicted lineup under a Luis Enrique. It's a bit of an interesting one, but up front, of course, you've got Enquinko, Havertz on the right, Felix on the left. You know, a midfield three of Mount playing that Rakitic role. Of course, Enzo Fernandez and obviously Kante midfield in defence. Silver, uh, Reese James playing that Danny Alves role. You know, inverting inwards and then overlapping outwards and being part of midfield when he has to. Then you guys can get the vision. And for me, and Quinco would be like that Messi in the team in an Enrique team where he is that link between the defence and attack. I could see Felix playing that Neymar role and Kai Havertz. I mean, if this guy could just finish, I think this guy would just be the forward for us. Who knows if that improves if he had like better scoring opportunities under a Luis Enrique. But in terms of the players we already possess, I kind of feel like Enrique could make sense of this squad. He could implement his vertical positional style game. And that's because this guy knows how to coach his teams to be able to play this way, to be effective. And he knows, most importantly, how to open up the game for his incredible attacking players. So that's Enrique out the way. Now let's move on to the next one. This is the bait one. This is the favourite for the job. And of course, that is Julian Nagelsmann. Now I find his exit from Bayern Munich incredibly fascinating and... You know, from an outsider perspective, you're only solely judging by results, right? Thinking, listen, the guy is still winning. He's barely lost. It's very harsh. But when you examine things deeper and from investigating what Bayern fans who are going to games and, you know, real diehard guys online are communicating to, they had a lot of criticism for Nagelsmann. Criticism came in the form of Bayern Munich kind of were playing on second gear. You know, they looked great one game, second game, not so good. They felt like there was so much formational changes that it was quite hard for them to really understand what was happening. They felt like he wasn't necessarily getting the best out of the attacking players at his disposal. But let's put this out there. Obviously losing Lewandowski, it forced Nagelsmann to have to make tweaks for this season. And when you don't have like the key fundamentals that you normally rely upon, it can get hard because it is like a bit of a lottery game that you're playing right now where is this going to work or is it not? And unfortunately, the attack just wasn't firing as much as they've used to over the past few years. And they didn't appreciate his tinkering. And it just seemed like some of his perspirationists behind the scenes weren't also on point as it could have been. For example, you know, he got sacked ultimately because, number one, he took an ill-timed uh, skiing trip after the loss to Leverkusen. The Bayern boards didn't like that. He fell out with Sadio Mane, plus many others as well too, who just were kind of getting fed up with what he was doing and there was some controversy behind the scenes with this relationship with the build reporters so listen i think sometimes when we look at managers we can so we can focus on the surface stuff right Ah, oh, results how he plays his age that type of base stuff but you know as nagelsman himself said to be a football manager it's 30 percent coaching and it's 70 percent social competence and it seems like when it comes to the social competence side that would be my only reservations for nagelsman and the only reason why i bring this up right now is because he's literally got sacked like just about over a week ago. For him to sign for us when he's still feeling that pain and hurt after being sacked from Bayern Munich, I'm sure our opportunity eases that pain a little bit, but how much time does he have to reflect about what went wrong, how to improve upon things and how to move on? He's still a very young guy. I'm not going to use one experience of one club to just like, you know, use that as a negative thing against him because he did phenomenal work at Hoffenheim as well as RB Leipzig. I think it's quite ironic too because this season when they didn't have Lewandowski, you know, he decided to give more responsibility and freedom to the players. So it's kind of ironic that that was the thing to ultimately kind of undermine his position in the end. But I guess if you want to see Pete Nagelsmann, you have to look at what he did at RB Leipzig because he made RB Leipzig like a proper European team. And he got them to a Champions League semi-final. I mean, that's incredible work. Now, he does adapt depending on his squad. He's used a lot of 4-2-3 run at Bayern Munich. But 
A back three setup tends to be more his baby, and he uses a ton of variations. Like, you know, if you like your managers to constantly switch formations up, you'll like Nagelsmann because you'll probably see at least six or seven different formations used throughout the season. His principles boil down to things like this. You know, he was once coached by Thomas Tuchel, and these guys are all part of the uh, Ralph Ragnick gang gang pressing gang. So his teams have to be compact. His teams have to press very high and intensely. He likes to funnel the opposition out to the wide areas to overload them in defense positions to win the ball back and kick star counter attacks. Like a lot of the goals that Leipzig scored came from high turnovers and turning those turnovers into chance creation. He doesn't encourage his teams to dribble the ball because passing the ball makes you move the ball a lot faster. And this is where central rotations come into play. Now, these central rotations can come in the form of wing backs inverting, for example. Uh, the midfield players in this pivot have to be very tactically on point because they're involved in the build-up in terms of progressing the players well too. And most importantly, they have to fill those overload positions in the field to maintain that balance in the team. And by constantly rotating like this, what you end up doing is you create passing angles where you can play one pass that takes out like two, three players from the opposition. And then you're kickstarting like defensive attack just like that. It's about forcing teams out of shape and then playing through that disruption. Now, these ideas could work with a younger squad that has no identity at this point in time. This will be harder to do at Bayern Munich because they caught some of the best players in the world playing for them and they've been winning things forever for so long that no guy can come in and tell these guys realistically what to do. I think Nagelsmann could be a success here for being objective, but he's also shown the difficulties in finding balance in the team when there isn't really any balance. So my thing is, how quickly has he learned his lessons and is he mentally ready now to sign for us, take over us and hopefully push us forwards? Now, as you guys have been seeing, like this is the idea of a lineup I could see under Nagelsmann. I think like uh, Mason Mount probably comes back in the fray because we need him for his counter pressing. I think N'Golo Kante, Enzo become even more important. My thing is though, what does this guy do up front? Could Aubameyang come back? I'm not too sure. I kind of think that he'd be forced to have to experiment with a strikeless formation again. So I'm going for Raheem Sterling up front. So that's Nagelsmann out of the way. I'm going to end things by discussing another manager, but this is probably the manager that I don't want us to sign, even though this guy is incredible too. And that is Ruben Amorim from Sporting Lisbon. Now, we can't forget last season, Lisbon won the double, the domestic double. They lost literally one game that entire season. That is incredible. And he's doing this with a super young squad and he's still maintaining that success this season. I mean, it's not quite the same, but they've sold so much talent over the past two windows, right? Obviously in Europe, big results against Frankfurt and Tottenham. And then recently in the Europa League, you know, beating high-flying Arsenal to progress. That is a massive achievement. And that tells you that this guy's ideas work. You know, Amarim's all about a back three. He's all about possession football. And I think how he uses his back three is really interesting because traditionally, the guy who plays in the middle of a back three stays behind the other two defenders. But Amarim wants this guy to push further forward. So it's like, depending on like the opposition press and the build-up structure, this guy in the middle can kind of act as like the makeshift defensive midfield player. So if you're Thiago Silva, I think you're absolutely in love because I think Thiago Silva is like a playmaker out from the back. But at the same time, his coaching principles rely upon things like a very intense high press and a lot of fluidity between his front three, which could also be quite interesting with the players we have at our disposal. Regardless though, there's a lot of onus from the guys at the back, from the very deep pivot, from the three defenders too, to, you know, find these passes between the lines to find the attacking players because the attacking players are close to the striker or it used to be Paulinho, but Amarim has been experimenting with like a strikerless type of thing and it has been working. Possession, high intensity, fluidity and interchanging in the front three as well too. It could definitely work here. I guess the only reason why I wouldn't be too keen for this is that I think with the players you have in disposal and the talent in the field, can we really afford to create a situation where we're prioritizing defenders over the talent we are signing in the field? I just don't think it makes sense anymore. Another fear I'd have is that when you play this possession football with wingbacks in the Premier League, a lot of teams sit back, they defend, they protect the spaces. And you risk that fear of being a very horizontal, slow passing team. And I've seen that before. I don't know necessarily if this style of playing gets the very best out of the players. But at the same time, I can also see it this way where Amarim is kind of like a Tuchel style manager and imagine if Tuchel had access to these types of players. But I would say this though, 
One interesting development is that Nuno Santos at uh, Sporting Lisbon, he's traditionally a winger. He has been playing more as like an offensive type of wing back. So he has been playing the Perisic role at Inter Milan where, you know, wing back is not like an attacking uh, fullback. It's like you're another wide midfield player. So it's a lot more flexible compared to other positions. Could you potentially see a Mudrick being used in a similar role? We saw Graham Porter try this once against Brighton in a terrible fashion that didn't really work out. But that idea in principle does work and we saw Trossard doing that at Brighton as well too. Maybe I'm being a bit too harsh, maybe there are solutions, but as I'm saying, I think there's too much talent in midfield for us to not utilise that now and staying strictly with the back three just isn't the way. So my friends, on that note, that is the video today. Share your thoughts and opinions. What manager do you want to see? Let us know below and of course, hit that like button and share this video. I'm Nini FC, this is Blue Lions TV. I'll catch you guys later with some more videos. Cool.